So Swift Concurrency, it's, it's an amazing new technology that is, I think, slowly but surely starting to make its way into all of our code bases. Uh, for the past year or so, year and a half, I've spent a lot of time with Swift Concurrency. I've been asked by various people to help them learn it, both companies or in mentoring sessions and that kind of stuff. And one very interesting thing that I've learned about Swift Concurrency is that it's a really good example of the kind of technology that takes very little effort to get started with. But then as soon as you start trying to peek behind the current and you start trying to peel back the layers and see what's going on, things grow in complexity at a really fast rate. I mean, the Swift team did a really good job to help us get up and running with Swift Concurrency in just a matter of minutes. I mean, we can make network calls with just one line of code now. But without Swift Concurrency, this would take like at least four, maybe five lines of code if you space things out properly. You could do it in one line if you do everything on one line. Right? But there's a lot here in just this one little line of code, which is really good because in my opinion, being able to read just one line of code that clearly says what I want is way better than scanning a bunch of lines of code with some closures, possibly more callbacks, and things getting really, really complicated. But at the same time, looks can be very deceiving, because that one line of code you just saw, it has a ton of implications in terms of functionality, in terms of what might be happening. And like I said, if we start peeling back layers to try and figure out what this does, things get very complicated. Before I get into that, I'm Donnie, and I would like to take you on this journey with uh, Swift Concurrency. Um, I wrote a bunch of books as well, in addition to being a freelance developer, that you can get with these two QR codes up there. Uh, you can go ahead and scan them, or you can just Google them or my name. Or It's not that hard to find them if you're looking for them, I would say. And of course, I'm working on a new book, uh, a third one to add there in the middle. I think that would look nice in place of my logo. It's going to be on concurrency. I can't tell you when it will be finished, because I don't know yet, but I'm, I would say I'm about halfway through. So soon, hopefully. Anyway, my talk today is called Your Brain on Swift Concurrency. And it's not an introduction to Swift Concurrency, because my goal is not to help you understand the very basics of Swift Concurrency. If you were here yesterday morning, you already know all the basics from Daniel, for example. Or maybe you've seen the basics. Instead, what I would like to explore is some of the things I've noticed as I've been teaching people Swift Concurrency. Uh, things that are confusing to people, things that are weird to me as well. Right? I say to other people as I was teaching, but that doesn't mean that as I'm teaching, I know all the answers. Right? Sometimes people ask things and I'm just like, really, I have no idea, so let's spend the next hour to try and figure this out because we should know this. Um, and also, all the things you're gonna learn today, you might even be fine not understanding or knowing some of it. Because like I said, all we need to get started is something like this. We don't need a lot of code to get started with Swift Concurrency. But let's unpack what we see here anyway. The first thing we see is that little try keyword. That tells us something. It tells us this might fail. We're going to attempt to do this, but it could throw an error in our face, and we're going to have to handle that. The other thing that this tells us is that there's an await. And that await means that whatever we're going to do might take a while, and we're going to have to wait for that. Right? In other words, we might have to suspend our execution to allow the network to do what it needs to do before it can assign something to our tuple right there. So as I'm explaining this, often there's somebody who would think something like this. Right? We should always make sure to await in the background then, right? because you just said that we suspend. So my typical response to that is, like, I'm not sure. Why should we await on the background? Why, why are you thinking that? And then the response is, well, obviously, you kind of just told us we're suspending execution. So clearly, we're blocking something. If we're not making progress because we're waiting, then if we're doing this on the main thread, the user cannot scroll. And that is a really, really good question to ask. Right? It's a really good thing to wonder about, because an await is it's a pretty big deal if you encounter that for the very first time. And I also like when people ask this because it's a great opportunity for me to start talking about suspension points. Because an await, interestingly enough, does more or less the opposite of blocking the thread. It says, I'm going to wait for something, so actually suspend the task that I'm on, put that elsewhere, and let somebody else do work on this thread. So if we we doing this on the main thread, what we're essentially saying is, I'm going to wait for a bit, so let other things happen on the main thread while the network is doing its thing. So how does that kind of work? 
first of all, Swift concurrency does not model itself on dispatch queues or threads in the same way that you might be used to from GCD. You might be looking at this and thinking, what does that represent then? Well, these blue blocks here are tasks. And we could have a bunch of them running, and a bunch of them could have finished, or some could be starting. And they're doing this concurrently, right? A bunch of them, sometimes four, sometimes eight. What's interesting is that the number of threads that you would see should be roughly equal to the number of CPU cores that you have. I say roughly because none of us are able to write iOS apps that have no other systems in place than Swift concurrency. Right? We still have some GCD even in stuff that Apple made. So we might have a few more. But the idea of Swift concurrency is to limit itself to the number of threads that the CPU can handle without any context switching. So that looks a little bit like this. So each CPU core that we have in our machine is going to be running a single thread in a Swift concurrency driven app. And that's very different from the code you would write in GCD right, or anything else that you would have done before. As soon as you say dispatch view global run something, if there's no thread available for that work to go on, they'll just make a new one. And that's really cool because that allows us to do a lot of things at the same time. But for a CPU, switching threads is really expensive, especially when compared to what Swift Concurrency does in terms of tasks. So Swift Concurrency uses tasks instead of threads. So if we suspend a task, we don't suspend a thread. We actually free up the thread to allow it to handle a different task. So what that looks like is a little bit like this. This blue box that you see here is a task that we're starting on thread number two. And at some point, this task hits an await. And at the same time, roughly, some other task begins. So this blue box goes into a cache. And what are we putting in that cache exactly? Well, we're putting everything that the task is doing into that cache. So we have any local state that is relevant for the task. We have any task local values. We have pretty much the priority. Everything that is needed for the task to later resume is put in the cache. Now, this green box is another task that's running. It's not the task that the blue box is waiting on, but it just happens to be a task that we started at roughly the same time that the blue box went into the cache. Threat 2 was available, so it was like, oh, I'll, I'll handle the green task. I'm, I'm available. I can do this. And at some point, this thing that the blue box was waiting on is finished, so the blue box can resume. And in this case, Threat 3 was around. And it was like, well, I'm available. Threat 2 is still busy with the green task. So let me pick up this one. So what's interesting to note here is that a thread and a task do not have any relationship other than the thread is running the task. We don't necessarily have to come back to the thread that we started on but we might. For example, if this green task now starts waiting, it is put into cache, the blue box can continue going. And if the green one is resumed, it might be resumed on thread two, because in this case, thread two had nothing else to do. So it's like, yep, I'll take up that task. What we are suspended, what you just saw, is that other tasks can make progress. And that's really important to keep in mind. And it's what I've said before, I'm going to say it a couple more times, because it's really important to keep in mind that threads and tasks are not the same thing. If you're blocking a task, you're not blocking a thread per se. And the other way around is also true. So at this point in, in workshops that I do, there's usually at least one person that I sort of see thinking. They go quiet. And they think more. And they're like, OK, so if I await something, he's saying that's not suspending. Okay, cool, cool, cool. But in GCD, if I would write this, then I have this dispatch queue main, that's some very slow operation. Some very slow operation takes a while, so that's blocking the main thread. Right? This dispatch queue main itself doesn't block because it's async, so whatever came before, it doesn't necessarily wait for this block to finish before whatever comes after. But the contents of this blocks block are definitely very slow. If we find a way to fix that, we would do this. Right? We would say dispatch queue global async, some very slow operation is not on the main thread, so this unblocks the main thread and allows the user to scroll. Great. So if you then translate this into Swift concurrency, then maybe something like this would block the main thread then. But the await is not blocking. I just explained that. But we're calling this super slow operation from the main thread. Therefore, it must be blocking. So it's still blocking. Donnie, you were completely wrong. Well, this function right here, it's slow. It's async. This is on main. So uh, at this point, things got pretty complicated, because the await still wasn't blocking at all. 
Because the await still means the exact same thing. I'm a task, I'm gonna wait for something, somebody else can go ahead and run. What could be blocking is something that is running on the main thread. However, that function that you just saw, that's not on the main thread, it's somewhere else. So that's weird, right? I was just able to tell you that it's not on main even though you called it from main. So how can we know where something runs then? If, if that wasn't on main, then how can we make it on main? And how can we, more importantly, at some point, make sure it's not on main? Do we use task and detach tasks all over the place to make sure that things are where we need them to be? We could try this, right? Would this make sure that some very slow operation is or is not on main? Nope. The function still does not change where it's executing, depending on whether you call it from main or from a detached task. Some very slow operation still runs in the same way because the system doesn't care where you call things from in Swiss concurrency. Instead, functions decide where they should run, more or less. And I say more or less because there's really, at this point in time, only two options available. Something will either run on the main actor or it runs on the global executor. And the global executor means a thread pool of every thread except the main thread. So how do we decide or determine, maybe, where a function will run? So any async function that is not otherwise constrained to a thread or actor will run on the global executor. So this function that you see right here is going to run on the global executor. Why? Because there's nothing tying it to the main actor. So a practical example of that. If I have a Swift UI view, right? I have my button right there. If I tap it, I'm gonna run a task because button closures are synchronous by default, so we need to go async. We make a task, we call our async function from there. We know that we're gonna call this function from the main actor, but you just saw how it was defined. Nothing was tying it to the main actor, therefore, this is going to run on a background thread. So even though you're calling it from main, the function is gonna run elsewhere, and it's gonna come back to main when the function is done. So how do we change that context? How do we make sure that something, if we should want that, runs on main? We can annotate a function with the main actor attribute. That will make sure that the main actor, which is almost synonymous, not quite, but it's often used inter interchangeable, I found, with the main thread. So this is gonna to tie to the main actor, which means it's going to run on the main thread. So now if we call perform some work, it is going to block the main actor, or the main thread. Not because we're awaiting it, but because the function is running there. So that was easy. The function is annotated with main actor. We know exactly where it runs, but things can get a little bit tricky. For example, if we look at this, it's a lot harder to reason about this. I've moved the main actor annotation up to the class level. This means that everything in the class, all of the mutable state and functions that we access, is going to be accessed through the main actor. That includes our async function right there. So even though it's not defined in place, and if this thing gets very big, and you miss the main actor on my view model, you might think that that function runs on the main, uh, off of the main actor, but it runs on the main actor due to how its owner constrains it. So does that make the await blocking then? If we're running the function on main, we're waiting for it on main, so main is blocked, obviously main is now not doing anything else, so the await's blocking. Again, and I, said, I, I told you I was gonna say this a couple times, awaiting something does not block the thread you are awaiting from. It depends on what's running and where that thing is running, because the function that we're calling is the thing that's slow and that's occupying a thread, not the fact that we're waiting for it. So what you just saw was an example of actor isolation, right? And that function that we had, the perform some work function, we might actually decide that everything in the view model except that one function should be on the main thread. We can opt out by marking a function as non-isolated. So if we say, well, this, this view model is used in a Swift UI view, so we should put a lot of the things in there on the main actor, um, we can do that. But just this one function, it, it does a bunch of stuff and it's really slow, so we don't want to perform all that work on the main actor. So we just mark it as non-isolated, which moves it away from the main actor. So what's the rule of thumb here? Well, the rule of thumb here is that async functions will run on the global executor unless they were specifically instructed not to do that. And you do that by either marking them as main actor or marking their owner as main actor. But here's an even trickier one for you, because I'm not done yet. 
this looks pretty similar to what you've seen before. We have a button that calls some expensive operation, and some expensive operation is defined right here. So where does that function run? There's no main actor on the struct, no main actor on some expensive operation. Who here thinks this is going to run on the main queue? Show of hand. Or main actor, main thread. OK, who here thinks it's going to run anywhere except on the main actor? I see Tim reluctantly raising his hand here. <laughs> so this is going to run on the main actor. This task starts on the main actor just like before. And this function is not tied to the main actor. However, this SwiftUI view uses a state object. And SwiftUI views that use a state object, observable object, or environment object gain an implicit main actor annotation, which means that that function right there also gained a beautiful implicit main actor annotation. So this will for sure run on main. Everybody that put their hand up for this is not going to run on main is really good because you understood everything I've said before because this was definitely a curveball. So this is something to keep in mind alongside what you've already learned. So what can we take away from all this? A key rule is functions will run on a global executor unless we tell them not to. We can mark methods or enclosing objects as main actor to enforce that they run on the main actor. And we can use non-isolated to break free or opt out of this main actor isolation on methods or properties that we don't want to be synchronized on the main actor. And switch UI views with observable object implicitly gain a main actor annotation, which bleeds through through all of the functions defined on it. So what about task then? Right? Because you might have thought that, well, if I start a new task that's going to be similar to creating a new dispatch queue or doing dispatch queue global or something like that, but what good are they to us if we can't even use them to decide where our code runs? There's two kinds of tasks that we can create in Swift Concurrency. One is an unstructured task. The other is a detached task. An unstructured task inherits a bunch of things from its creation context where the detached task does not. More on that in a moment. It's also good to know that tasks can produce results. So we can have a task that does some work, and then we can await the value for the task if the task returns something. If the task might throw an error, we're going to have to try await it. But it's, it's kind of nice that we can have a task produce some value. So when we create a task, a couple of things can happen. Right? We might have an unstructured task, which is the one that we created with the simple task initializer. That task will inherit things like the actor execution context, which means that if we create a task on the main actor, that task will run on the main actor because it inherits that actor. Note that this does not make that task a child task. It's very easy to, to think that if I create a task as part of another task, that becomes a child task. If that were true, it wouldn't be an unstructured task. It would be a structured task. But it's an unstructured task, which means it's going to exist alongside the creation context. If we make a detached task, we inherit nothing. Right? So if we make a detached task starting on the main actor, we will run on the global executor because we don't inherit the actor context. If there's any task local values, we don't inherit those either. Right? So that breaks free from everything that we know. However, both of these are their own little islands of concurrency. So they're going to run in, concurrent, uh, in parallel with other tasks or concurrent with other tasks depending on factors like CPU cores, uh, but they are their own islands, which means that they really don't interact with the other tasks in the system at all, per se, unless we're awaiting things from them explicitly. So when do we use these? First and foremost, we use them as little as possible. And you've just seen that it doesn't really do anything when I create a task to call a function. It doesn't change where the function is run. So really, we only create tasks when we explicitly want something to run alongside something else that we're doing. So if we want to perform a couple things at once, you might have a couple tasks, because otherwise, you can only do one thing at a time. And when we do, we want to use unstructured tasks. Right? If we create detached tasks everywhere, th those are going to be completely free-floating, and we don't gain anything from that. Right? So the Swift team. As far as I've seen, they kind of say, uh, detached tasks prefer unstructured and only go detached if a, a, an unstructured task does not do what you need to do 
Right? If you say, well, I don't want to run on main, therefore I need a detached task, why? You can define a function that's not tied to the main actor that will actually not run on the main actor. So you don't need a detached task for that. So only use them if you can't achieve what you want to achieve without a detached task. So I've mentioned unstructured tasks. That implies that there is something else, a structured task, unstructured concurrency. So what's that? I've left this concept near the very end because I hope that with the information you have right now, you already know a lot more about how tasks work, how they interact with each other, how things decide where they execute, and all that kind of stuff. But it's, it's also kind of important to know what structured concurrency is because it will make you see how it's a very expensive word for a not too expensive concept. What I do love about it, it's actually one of the few things I found in programming that was actually invented recently. Like all of Swift concurrency is based on a lot of older principles, except structured concurrency. Although I kind of lie because it's based on something from the 60s, but that's not the exact same thing. Because it's based on something called the fork join model, which I'll show in a moment. Um, but that doesn't have the same guarantees as unstructured or as structured concurrency. So that's just a fun little tidbit. Structured concurrency in Swift relates to tasks and their children. What that means is that when you await a function call, and that function call is awaiting other child tasks, that all of those child tasks must complete before the task that you started off in can complete. Right? A, a structured task cannot leave any uncompleted child tasks alive before it finishes. So that's why the other task is called unstructured, because it can outlive the, the creation scope. So, a function can use tools like asynclet or task groups to create such child tasks. So here's what that looks like. There's a bit of a longer piece of code. It's, a, it's an async function, fetch user information. We started off by awaiting a current user that we get from some object that's called a user provider. Then we create three asynclets. What this does is it's going to kick off three implicitly created child tasks, one to fetch favorites, one for friends, one for posts. Those are going to start running immediately. So we're going to make three network calls or read from the cache or whatever these functions do. Whatever they do, they're going to do it asynchronous. And at some point, we want to wait for all of these tasks to complete so that we can construct a user profile. So we use try await profile for user favorites, friends posts. What's really cool here is that I didn't have to write three awaits. You can do that if you want. You could say profile for user, favorites, await favorites, friends, await friends, etc. However, just like how try works for the entire expression on the line, we can use one await for all the things that we're awaiting. So what does this look like if we were to kind of graph it out and sort of show that fork join model in action? It looks a bit like this, for example. We have one starting point. We fan out into a bunch of child tasks and eventually fan back in because all the child tasks must complete before the parent task can continue or at least finish. So this is not the easiest way to talk about what's happening. So let's visualize that again. So we might have uh, a starting point, the blue task right here. It's going to kick off maybe two child tasks. Could be async-let, could be in a task group. But it's going to be two child tasks. So they're going to make some progress. And at some point, what could happen is that this blue task needs to await something off its own. Right? It could say, try await user's profile picture. These child tasks that we created, they're going to keep making progress. Right? So this blue parent task is suspended, which is completely fine. The child tasks can just keep going on their own. At some point, these child tasks might complete. The blue one will also be able to resume at that point. And only now can the blue one also complete. If the child task were still running at this point, the blue task could not complete, because it must wait for all of its child tasks to complete, or be canceled, or otherwise stop running. So let's see what this means if we add one of these unstructured tasks and why you probably shouldn't be using them all the time, right? Because what we had before was pretty safe, actually. If we have these child tasks, we know that they don't linger. They don't keep doing stuff when the parent task is no longer around. So back to this little snapshot that we've already kind of seen where the parent task is suspended, it's waiting for something, we have the child task doing a bunch of stuff, and at some point we create that red block, which is an unstructured task. If everything completes, that red block could still be running. And this would be very common, actually, in code that uses async sequences if you're not managing them at all. 
Because if you start iterating over an async sequence in a task, and you don't stop the task when you no longer need it, like if your view goes off screen and you're not starting this from a task in a Swift UI view, you would keep the task alive because you probably started this in an unstructured task, which is completely fine, but you do need to think about how that stays alive for a very long time. So the reason I wanted to talk a little bit about structured concurrency is not that I think that you're going to be thinking about structured concurrency all the time. Quite on the contrary, I hardly ever think about structured concurrency when I'm using Swift concurrency because the Swift team designed it really well in a way where I can just use Swift concurrency without constantly thinking about all the details. However, understanding the details is really kind of nice because that means that sometimes when something weird happens or when you're trying to make a choice about like how do I introduce concurrency here, you can make better choices when you kind of understand the fine details of this. So before we wrap up, there's one last concept that I want to mention that's actors. Because I've mentioned them earlier, like the main actor, and I've talked about synchronizing and everything. Um, but I haven't really explained them at all. Right? And I know that actors is a pretty complicated topic. But I mentioned the main actor, and I said that the main actor is bound to the main thread. And that's because the main actor uses a private Swift feature for now, which is allowing the main actor to have its own executor. And executors can bind themselves to threads. So that's why the main actor can bind things to the main thread, and the global executor can bind to anything else. I just want to mention, in the future, we will be able to have our own executors. And at that point, I really hope that core data, for example, can properly migrate over to Swift concurrency, along with probably an overall of everything else that is public facing. Uh, because right now, core data has to be bound to threads, which we cannot explicitly do. Anyway, actors synchronize access to their mutable state. Right? So if we define an actor, we just define them just like similar to how we do a class. And we could have a private variable in there. And we might have this function here. Right? And this function could be called concurrently to get date formatters. It's going to check, do we have a formatter in the cache? Um, if not, we're going to create a new one. Now, this code might look pretty innocent to you. And you might be like, well, what's, what's the problem with this? Why does that need to be an actor? Well, the issue is that formatter using can be called concurrently. And we need that to be serialized. Because if we don't, we're going to get data corruption. We're going to get crashes. It's going to be really hard to debug. And everybody will be very sad. So making this an actor uh, allows us to have concurrent calls to formatter for be serialized, and we would be much happier. And you might be thinking to yourself, ah, so if I need a serial queue, I'm going to use an actor, and it's going to be fantastic. Well, no. Actors are not like serial queues. And the reason for that is because we have a concept called actor reentrancy, which essentially means that a suspended actor is not locked. So let's look at an example of that. If we have a data processor here that processes a bunch of stuff, um, we might have an await in there, which we do. And it's awaiting an upload of something. Right? And the code does a check to see how many items do we have cached currently, or how many items are we holding on to. If it's less than 10, that's fine. And also, we cannot already contain the existing item. If that's true, we're going to await stuff. I'm going to insert items. Now, what might happen is that as soon as we hit that await there in the middle, we are suspended. So the actor is not doing anything. So anybody else that calls this process item function will get access to the actor up until it awaits the other thing. Then once the first await is completed, that line runs. Then the other await completes, that line runs again. And now we might have a count larger than 10, simply because we started calling the function. At that time, we're calling it items is less than 10. Then we're going to wait twice. And then we're going to run the other thing because it's not serialized again, right? So if that await would be serialized, you wouldn't have re-entrancy, and then everything would run in one go. You might also want to say that process items does not run atomically. Anyway, in summary, building a mental model around what runs where in Swift concurrency really isn't trivial, especially because Apple really doesn't document this at all. What I've learned about this, I found out through experimentation and asking questions on the Swift forums which I guess is, for some things, the closest thing we can get to actual documentation, um, which is kind of cool that we can have the forum to ask these questions and to learn. I sometimes do wish that Apple would be more proactive in documenting some of the more important and interesting parts of concurrency and other things. It's also good to know that await is not a blocking operation. No matter what happens, no matter how blocked you are after awaiting something, the await itself is not blocking anything. 
Functions run on a global executor unless instructed otherwise. This was a big one for me when I learned that. Create tasks only when needed. You probably need fewer tasks than you think you do. When I first started doing concurrency, I made everything a task. I would ideally detach myself as much as I could. Then I learned that that's really not a good idea and not needed at all. Structured concurrency is used to describe the relationship between parent and child tasks, with the site note that creating a task from within another task does not automatically make it a child task. We can only make child tasks with asynclet and task group at this point. And lastly, actors are not like zero keys. And that's all I have for you today. Thank you.